going to open line talking about scary stories right here in Nashville, haunted Nashville, getting a sense of of what's on some of those ghost tours when when people are going around hearing about various sites here in Nashville and then getting some calls. I've really been interested in the calls from people about a house here or there and what what they've experienced. Um, so just hearing some interesting score stories. Happy to have with us Mick Woodard. He is a, a he's with Ghost City Tours and they operate all over the country. And and so you don't do you do this in Nashville, but you're aware of what goes on in other cities, I guess. And so like what are some other cities that stand out as really having some interesting paranormal history? Right. Um, so as I was telling you during the break, um, I worked in St. Augustine for a little bit to um, help uh, get some guides going off the ground on that. And there is, you know, St. Augustine is the oldest city in the United States, or at least the oldest European founded city in the United States. And because of that, and because of all the conflict that surrounded Florida, you know, that led to a very sort of bloody, nasty history that had uh, contributed to a lot of what they say, some of the hauntings around there, but also kind of similar in the similar vein. And I know I keep going back to this, the limestone presence here in Tennessee, they almost have a sort of similar situation, especially down in St. Augustine with the material they call coquina. Now, coquina is made out of essentially pressurized seashells, which are also made out of this calcium and salt, like much like the limestone here. And because of that, it's also said to relate a lot of those sort of energies and project a lot of that, but also just the general tragedies that have just befallen St. Augustine in the 400 plus years they've been around. So we got that. There's also Salem, of course, and their Salem, extensive history. The witch trial, Salem? Yes, sir. Salem, oh, well, that would be, yeah, that seems like that would be very haunted. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that seems very Salem spooky. And it, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, and there's plenty of, you know, activity going on around there just between the overall, you know, the... Uh, deaths of the witches that had occurred there or alleged witches um, and the overall concept of it being kind of like a quote unquote spiritual hub for those witches to have congregated at. So it all kind of plays into all of these stories that people wind up seeing things there and experiencing things that are a little extra normal. Can you, I mean, I'm just fascinated by these stories. I, I know you don't want to necessarily give away a story here in Nashville, but what about St. Augustine. Is there one yeah. you could maybe come close to giving away that just gives us a sense, even though we don't necessarily live there, and don't give it all away, but right. give us some sense of what's right. going on, like what, what a story might be like. So, you know what? I will actually tell you this story because I wound up seeing something in my time in St. Augustine at this location. So there is a cemetery that was reserved for the Catholic presence uh, in uh, St. Augustine for the longest time called the Talamato Cemetery, named after the Talamato Native American tribe that was originally found there. And there, the a, a bishop and uh, another member of the clergy were actually buried in a mausoleum that is on that cemetery property. And they have been reported as seen uh, walking around all the property um, and it's very it's a big deal because these guys were very influential in the sort of community growth of the city of St. Augustine and it's uh you know over 200 years ago or something like that. So they have been seen wandering around the graves in that cemetery just because largely the fact that their bodies are there and of course as they were performing funeral rites being members of the clergy they probably spent a lot of time there that way as well. But when I was in St. Augustine and I was uh, working through some of these stories with some folks, I had seen somebody who actually walked in front of a large sort of, not necessarily mausoleum, but a large above ground tomb. And he had walked over and looked completely like covered in a white light. So I couldn't really make out any facial features, but he walked behind this over, uh, above ground tomb, disappeared. <laughs> we actually went around to, uh, yeah, wow. we went around to the other side of the cemetery where there is another viewing location of all the graves and no sign of that person at all. So that's a big thing that I like to tell. Just, you know, you go to these things and 
part of it is, you know, you kind of anticipate it. They are drawn to the people who are looking for them a little bit. So, you know, whether that's confirmation bias is, you know, debated by some people. But at the same time, just it takes just one experience like that to have you like, OK, I'm, I'm hooked on this and I want to learn more or I want to get more involved in it. Absolutely. Very interesting. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. Let's go to Terry. Terry. Hello, Terry. Hello. Hi, Terry. Go right ahead. Hi. Um, I would like some information on Printer's Alley, actually, because Skull's Rainbow Room, Boots Randolph's, and the Western Room, things have happened in there. Now, I've personally been in um, Skull's, and they... I, before I had heard that they threw change, change was thrown at people toward the bar, which is right in front of the stage, and there was no one on stage. And um, that happened to me. We went on my wedding night when I was very young, and my friend who later uh, got married went down there on his wedding night and it happened to him too so i'd like to hear a little bit about the history about uh printer's alley makes sense there would be something there um what about printer's alley so printer's alley was a very uh interesting part of our history um not only the location of several you know publishing houses but it was kind of one of those things where five o'clock rolled around the lights turned off and then they came on with a bit of a red hue because printer's alley then became a big spot for uh, speakeasies and a few brothels all along that way there right so that's the, the whole alley has just stories upon stories and i guarantee you, you talk to the employees of pretty much anyone in those uh bars or restaurants or any of them they will have some kind of experience that they will share with you that's what i tell everybody try and find some stories themselves um, but skulls in particular, um, so I, I call it sort of a double haunting because skulls rainbow room is built into this fairly large building, right? It basically encompasses that whole downward uh, path that leads into printer's alley from fourth Avenue. So the front side, the Southern turf side um, is the place that had the Southern turf bar and its owner who had shot himself when he refused to be evicted from his apartment so he ha uh, he was hanging around there and messing with tenants that had moved in after his uh, demise but those also extended into the rainbow room side after it had opened you see uh, so the rainbow room opened 1948 right and like a lot of places that have multi-story buildings when you're a restaurant or bar you keep inventory on another floor right that is how skulls operated and the employees and actually the employees in there to this day will complain about going up to those upper floors because they might encounter just odd things like if there's menus uh, loose loose menus flying around there that would be one uh, one instance some of them have complained about the sort of sudden change in temperature with like blasts of cold air hitting parts of their bare skin like the back of their neck um, every now and then they'll also complain about the smell, this like wafting smell of a cologne of a very old man that would sort of like show up and it just disappear in different spots or it would follow people and you didn't smell it at all until you got up to that floor <clears throat> or and it would uh, dissipate by the time you started leaving it. So that has been an attribution to Mr. Johnson, who was the owner of the uh, Southern Turf Bar. But of course, Skull came with his own tragic story. Um, for the locals who are here at the time, you might've known about this, um, for the relative newcomers, the owner of the Rainbow Room, David Schulman, uh, was unfortunately murdered inside of his own bar in 1998. Um, and I think he was one of those people that also refused to leave. When they actually renovated the bar in 2016 as part of you know bringing it into the 21st century, his blood was still on the original floors of the bar. Wow. Because mm -hmm, they, uh, the, his killers had uh, basically taken a knife to Skull and left, obviously, significant little 
puddle of blood in their wake, but his blood still stained that, and they simply put some new paneling over that. And that's another big indication of something uh, being tied to another spirit, bloodshed, um, to go to a completely different uh, side. Washington, D.C.'s Ford Theater has apparently a few hauntings surrounding the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in there, right? That's a big bloodshed moment for him, I would say. Right, right. So um, that's so all that's that fascinating. Kind of, yeah, that's all fascinating. OK, um, all right, we have to take a break. Uh, then we'll come back, continue our discussion. Take a break. Be back right after this.